Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavir Yang Karavavahai, Tejas Vinava Ditamastu, <coughs> Mavid Vishavahai, <coughs> Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om, may the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saturday class. We're taking up a new book today. It is Swami Prabhavananda's translation and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. It's titled, How to Know God. And the title is very descriptive. That's exactly what uh, is meant by Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. When we still the thought waves of the mind, uh, what is what remains is the divine presence in all its glory. When our universe, which may contain the living presence of the divine in the manifest form, disappears, then what is what remains is beyond description. So just a few words about why Swami Prabhavananda wrote this book. It was evident to the Swami in trying to teach Patanjali's Yoga Sutras that many of his Western disciples, including the monastics, were having difficulty understanding and assimilating what Swami Vivekananda wrote in his book, Raja Yoga, which was his translation and commentary. So the Swami decided he would put the a translation and commentary into more modern English and frame it in such a way that he knew that the disciples, at least that were familiar to him, would be able to access it. So we're going to start with, and I always think it's important to do these things. Oftentimes people skip the front matter in a book and just go right to the content. Having lived with a very successful writer for 47 years, <clears throat> I saw the mistake in that. Uh, the, uh, a writer will try to give us some sense of their intentions and their methodology in these prefaces and forewords and introductions. So this will start with the what's called the translator's forward. Swami, Swami Prabhavananda wrote, Patanjali, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, aphorisms, 
are not the original exposition of a philosophy, but a work of compilation and reformulation. References to yoga practices, spiritual disciplines, and techniques of meditation, which enable a man to achieve unitive knowledge of the Godhead, are to be found already in the Kata, Svatasvatara, Taitriya, and Ma. Someone say that word, please. Maitreyani. Maitreyani. Maitreyani oh, Maitreya's Upanishad. Maitreyani's Upanishads. Very many centuries earlier. Indeed, the yoga doctrine may said to have been handed down from prehistoric times. In other words, before there was any writing that would give us any idea of the history. Handed down from prehistoric times. What Patanjali did was to restate yoga philosophy and practice for the man of his own period. But what was his period? And what, when was Pata, and who was Patanjali? Hardly anything is known about him. Some authorities believe that there were really two Patanjalis, one a grammarian and the other the author of the sutras. Others deny this. As for the date of the sutras, the guesses of the scholars vary widely, ranging from 4th century BC to the 4th century AD. In other words, a span of 800 years. It may have been any time in there. The simplest meaning of the word sutra is thread. A sutra is, so to speak, the bare thread of an exposition, the absolute minimum that is necessary to hold it together, unadorned by a single bead of elaboration. Only essential words are used. Often, there is no complete sentence structure. There was a good reason for this method. Sutras were composed at a period when there were no books. The entire work had to be memorized, and so it had to be expressed as tersely as possible. <clears throat> Patanjali's sutras, like all others, were intended to be explained, expanded and explained. The ancient teachers would repeat an aphorism by heart and then proceed to amplify it with their own comments for the benefit of the pupils. In some instances, these comments also were memorized, transcribed at a later date, and thus preserved for us. Cindy, do you have the book open in front of you? Cindy? Yes, I do. <laughs> Could you start reading? My, my voice is going. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know why, but it is. Oh, well, that's fine. Uh, start with in this translation. Okay. In this translation, we have not only provided a commentary, but expanded and paraphrased the aphorisms themselves, so that each one becomes an intelligible statement in the English language. Certain other translators have been unwilling to take this liberty, and have therefore offered a version of the text which is approximately literal, but as cryptic as a professor's lecture notes. It cannot be understood at all until its commentary has been carefully studied. 
We believe that this kind of translation has a bad psychological effect on the reader, being at first glance unable to make anything of the aphorisms themselves, he is apt to decide that the whole subject is too difficult for him. Enough difficulties exist anyway in the study of yoga philosophy. It has been our aim not to increase them unnecessarily. Our commentary is mainly our own work. However, we have followed the explanations of the two ancient commentators, Boha and Vyasa. We have also quoted frequently from the brilliant and deeply intuitive comments of Swami Vivekananda. These comments were made extempore, extempore during the classes on Patanjali, which the Swami held in the United States more than 50 years ago. They were written down by his students and are included in his book on Raja Yoga. Since yoga, prior to Patanjali, was originally grounded in Vedanta philosophy, we have interpreted the aphorisms throughout from a Vedantist viewpoint. In this, we differ from Patanjali himself, who was a follower of, of Sankhya philosophy. But these are merely technical differences, and it is best not to insist on them too strongly, lest the reader become confused. They are briefly explained at appropriate points in our commentary. In general, we have wished to present this book as a practical aid to the spiritual life, an aid that can be used by the devotees of any religion, Hindu, Christian, or other. We have therefore avoided dwelling much on its metaphysical and occult aspects. The study of these may fascinate some types of minds, but it is ultimately sterile and may even be dangerous if carried to excess. It was suggested to us while we were working on the book that we should introduce into it a comparison of yoga and modern Western psychology. Such a comparison has already been attempted by various writers, and some interesting points of similarity and dissimilarity in theory and technique have been noted. But, from our point of view at least, the comparison in itself seems neither fair nor valid. Yoga psychology is a finished product. Western psychology is still developing and along several divergent lines, continually producing new theories and discarding old ones. If one says categorically, Western psychology holds this view, dot, 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 one is always in danger of being reprimanded for inaccuracy. Hmm. We may, however, make one statement safely. The majority of Western psychotherapists do not, as yet, recognize the existence of the Atman, the Godhead within man, and do not, therefore, attempt to help their patients achieve the union of perfect yoga. As for those psychotherapists, now becoming quite numerous, who take a serious interest in yoga, many of them would no doubt state their position somewhat as follows. We can help our patients to a certain point to an adequate degree of adjustment on the psychophysical level. Beyond that, we're not ready to go. We recognize the possibility of a higher spiritual integration, but we prefer not to make it a part of our therapy because we believe that the two should be kept separate. If a patient wants spiritual integration, we can only send him to a yoga teacher or a minister of religion. Where we leave off, yoga begins. Hold on just a minute, Cindy. Hmm? This, this was not speculation by the Swami. He knew psychotherapists, the Swami did. And so this is kind of a summary of what they told him. So this was not, he wasn't speculating about what 
psychotherapists might say. He was stating here or restating what they had actually told him and of course summarizing it as one voice speaking. But he, he, he knew a number of people, some of them were in his congregation. Okay, thank you, Cindy. And there for the present, the problem rests. In conclusion, we must gratefully acknowledge the permission given to us to quote from the following books. Erwin Schrodinger's What is Life, published by the Cambridge University Press, the volume containing The Way of a Pilgrim, and The Pilgrim, the Pilgrim Continues His Way, translated by R. M. French and published by the Society for Pro Promoting Christian Knowledge of London, the Bhagavad Gita, translated by the present authors and published by New American Library, and the following works published by the Vedanta Press of Hollywood, Shankara's Crest Jewel of Discrimination, Prabhavananda Isherwood, The Eternal Companion, Prabhavananda, and The Upanishads, Prabhavananda Manchester. All a bunch of great books you guys should read. Okay, that's all. <laughs> okay. So before we go ahead, are there any comments from your own wisdom or experience that you'd like to offer or any um, concern or question you'd like to raise about what we're about to embark on here? All right, so uh, we plunge right in. Cindy, do you mind continuing to read? Sure. Okay. Okay. And we begin. How to Know God, the Yoga Aphorisms of Patanjali. One, section one, uh, yoga and its aims. Number one, this is the beginning of instruction in yoga. Basically, yoga means union. It is the Sanskrit ancestor of the English word yoke. Hence, it comes to mean a method of spiritual union. A yoga is a method, any one of many, by which an individual may become united with the Godhead, the reality which underlies this, underlies this apparent ephemeral universe. To achieve such union is to reach the state of perfect yoga. Christianity has a corresponding term, the mystic union, which expresses a similar idea. Bo, bo, boja? Boja, boja. Boja? Mm -hmm. boja? One of the classical commentators on these aphorisms defines Patanjali's use of the word yoga as an effort to separate the Atman, or real, the reality, from the non-Atman, or the apparent. One who practices yoga is called a yogi. Okay, let's, let's stop there and say very clearly that the purpose of this book and the purpose of this study is for us to get a much clearer idea of what the reality is and what the unreality is, which is mainly the contents of our waking awareness and our subconscious mind. And this book will lead us very thoughtfully and carefully to a greater understanding of the reality, which is only to be realized, it's beyond expression in words. We can, it can be pointed the way to, and there are steps to make it possible for us to achieve that state of realization. And we learn as we go along to separate that from 
the world of our embodied experience and how to make our embodied experience a more and more perfect reflection of the reality rather than the unreality of Maya or however you choose to characterize it. So before we advance, are there any questions about that particular idea of what it is we're up to? Okay, uh, it's very good to see so many of you here this morning. This is a book well worth your attention and will reward you for your efforts and your time spent with us. So thank you. Cindy, you want to go ahead? Sure. <clears throat> Number two, yoga is the control of thought waves in the mind. According to Patanjali, the mind, chitta, is made up of three components, manas, buddhi, and am ahamkar, ahamkar. Manas is the recording faculty, which receives <coughs> impressions gathered by the senses from the outside world. Buddhi is the discriminative faculty, which classifies these impressions and reacts to them. Ahamkar is the ego sense, which claims these impressions for its own and stores them up as individual knowledge. For example, Manas reports, a large animate object is quickly approaching. Buddhi decides, that's a bull. It is angry. It wants to attack someone. Ahamkar screams, it wants to attack me, Patanjali. It is I who see this bull. It is I who am frightened. It is I who am about to run away. <laughs> Later, from the branches of a nearby tree, Ahamkar, am I saying that right? Ahamkar, uh -huh. Ahamkar may add, now I know that this bull, which is not I, is dangerous. There are others who do not know this. It is my own personal knowledge, which will cause me to abo avoid this bull in future. Now, th that is, notice that these three things are necessary manas buddhi and ahamkar for us to learn and appropriately react to the universe of name and form and so these three things create the thought waves in the mind so this is why Patanjali starts with this definition of what it is that is creating the thought waves that yoga is going to teach us how to control. So it's very important for us to understand these three categories, that which gathers the impressions, that which categorizes the impressions and that which reacts to the impressions. And it is a nearly instantaneous activity that goes on within us and it goes on in us continually. It is how we create the universe in which we live. We project the universe each of us has our own. Much of it is shared, no doubt. But each of us has our own universe made up of our own understandings based on our experiences. And so we see name and form according to our own understanding. And out of that, we make our universe. Okay, Cindy, thank you.
You want to go ahead? No, yeah, I just I had to unmute again. Sorry. Um, God, the underlying reality, is by definition omnipresent. If the reality exists at all time, excuse me, if the reality exists at all, it must be everywhere. It must be present within every <clears throat> sentient being, every inanimate object. God within the creature is known in the Sanskrit language as the Atman or Purusha, the real self. Patanjali speaks always of the Purusha, which means literally the Godhead that dwells within the body. But we shall substitute Atman throughout this translation because Atman is the word used in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, and students are therefore likely to be more accustomed to it. According to the Upanishads and the Gita, the one Atman is present within all creatures. Patanjali, following Sankhya philosophy, believed that each individual creature and object has its separate but identical Purusha. This philosophical point of difference has no practical importance for the spiritual aspirant. The mind seems to be intelligent and conscious. Yoga philosophy teaches that it is not. It is only a borrowed intelligence. The Atman is intelligence itself, is pure consciousness. The mind merely reflects that consciousness and so appears to be conscious. Again, an absolutely key point for us to keep in mind. This stardust spacesuit that we inhabit does not have any intelligence of its own. A dead body, as we know, is inert. There is no intelligence. It reacts to nothing. So when the spirit that is that which is reflected in this body departs the body, we see the true nature of the body. And it's very important for us to keep this in mind during the time that we're studying yoga. This body is not itself alive. It reflects the aliveness of pure consciousness the indweller, the Atman. And so though it seems to be alive, it seems to have all of its faculties and capabilities and so on. In fact, the moment the spirit leaves the body, then none of that continues to exist. So this is what the first six steps of yoga, the first six limbs, as Patanjali calls them, of yoga, teach us, is how to separate ourselves in consciousness, in awareness, from our idea that the stardust spacesuit is anything more than a thing made of the dust of exploded stars and has no life of its own. A very key point. Now, before we go on, because some two, some several key points have been made about the nature of our ability to project a universe, the manas, the mind, the buddhi, the discriminative faculty, and the ahamkar, that which seems to create an individual consciousness. And now this idea that all of that which is housed within this, within which all of those faculties is housed, is in itself lifeless, inert, 
though it appears to be conscious. Anything at all about those points, because until we have in, assimilated those, internalized those, we're not going to understand the techniques that Patanjali teaches us. Brother Shankar? Yes, dear. Are you on? Are you on? I just want to clarify. Am I correct from my previous uh, sessions that Ahankar does not belong to us? Well, just, like there, don't, just, just like Gunas don't belong to us? That's perfectly correct. Ahamkar, our sense of individual self, is simply a reflection of the one. There is only one Ahamkar, only one eye maker. <clears throat> it is that which has deliberately manifested this universe as cosmic consciousness. But cosmic consciousness cannot be said to be conscious in the sense that we think of consciousness. It is consciousness itself. So when it does manifest by its will, as Swami Sarvapriyananda once said in a talk, when asked the question, well, why did it do this? He, had, he said, the answer is very simple and very American because it can but it is that it that has all inus in it we do not have ahamkar it's a reflection in us and it, the the reflection is caused called within the system of Sankhya, it's called the causal body. And it is the fifth of the five layers of a human being's um, seeming reality. Does that clarify it? Yes, you did. And there's one more question. It is yes. that it is uh, that it has the eyeness. On the other hand, we also say that it has no attributes and I no, 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 no. It has the, the it, Brahman in its inactive or nirguna Brahman has no attributes when it manifests mm -hmm. as saguna brahman it has many many attributes because now there is manifestation now there is the appearance of time space and causation so is there any essential difference sri ramakrishna says no water still brahman water in waves saguna brahman same water he says it seems as if there is a stick in the water that separates one from the other the stick that's in the water is our reflection of this and it is very very hard to grasp intellectually that's why patanjali very carefully teaches us the practice of meditation and he teaches it to us in a series of six steps so that we can grasp unreality of the apparent and the true reality of that which of which the apparent is a reflection 
Thank you, Brother Shankara, and an extension of it then. Will it be fair to say also that the manas and buddhi don't belong to me? They of also course are... not. Of course not. They're all... Nothing belongs to us. Nothing belongs. The me that you're is speaking is called Vijay Nikor. In an undetermined number of years, that personality that is speaking, Vijay Nikor, will be no more. The vehicle that seems to carry that name and speaks as that personality will simply run out of gas, as it were. Run out of, uh, it's the, the, the energy that produced it. And so it will fall down. And that in that, moment it becomes very clear that that being that personality never owned anything in fact never was anything real this is what we learn through the practice of yoga that we we are an appearance that is created out of the desire for appearance. And the desire is not our own. The desire is the desire of the cosmic consciousness that expresses it in, in the Chandogya Upanishad as I am one, I shall body myself forth as many. But the, it's only a vibration of consciousness that begins, which is characterized by all of the great teachers as a magic show, a dream, a stage play, a movie. It, 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 it comes and it goes and has no essential reality. Brother Shankara, is that same as Mahamaya of well, the, the Mahamaya is the name for the appearance in all its aspects, in all its convincingness, yes. And it has no beginning and it has no end. Am I right? I mean... No, it has no beginning, no end. It has no... <clears throat> it, it, is, it, it is simply a, an aspect, as Sri Ramakrishna said. There is no difference at all between the water still and the water in waves, except that the water in waves has waveforms. We are, each of us, one of those tiny waveforms, an infinitesimal portion of mm -hmm. that. And so the wave arises, this tiny wave arises and then subsides. But that of which it was a wave never changed. It's just that there, there is this waveform, which in all of its convincing and compelling aspects is called Mahamaya. Yes. Right. The power of Brahman made manifest. So the power of Brahman is uh, Mahadevi that we, you know. Yes, that's a, that's another way of saying it. It could be Saguna Brahman or Mahadevi. Saguna Brahman, Mahadevi, Mahamaya. Uh, all these are, are names. Shakti, Kali. Mm -hmm. You know, all these are just names for different names for Saguna Brahman or Saguna Atma. Okay, thank you. So, Brother Shankara. Yes. Hey, it's Anshu. I've been dying to ask a question. Yes. Well, stop dying. Live. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so, I've been reading a lot about, you know, you planted the seed in me a long time ago, and it was this seed that don't necessarily 
disbelieve things that you have no experience in, right? Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this concept, you use the word vibration, consciousness, um, and, you know, the relationship between cosmic consciousness and our consciousness and, and all of this stuff. But basically what I'm saying is I want to really like dig into what thought is, right? And like the control of thought waves to create either positive or negative thoughts, right? Like I, I figure like, can you, you, you want to cultivate the positive side of reality, right? Like positive vibrations. Yes, Patanjali recommends that very strongly and, and tells us exactly how to do it. Uh, he says, replace lower samskaras, mental impressions, which take the form of thought waves for us, with higher ones, with higher right. samskaras, slowly and slowly. And in, uh, he, he very carefully explains and the Swami goes into some uh, detail here in this book on the niyamas, the observances that are the replacement of the lower thought forms of thought waves, which are the, the sense of I, me, mine, with the higher forms of thought waves, which are thou, the thine, so that we lose this sense slowly and slowly through our practices of I am, I must take care of myself, I must, and all, all these things, I, that I am at the center of the universe. So, Shantra? yes, yes. Is there a parallel between what you just said uh, and uh, the gunas moving from tamasic to rajasic to sattvic gunas? Yes, dear, but let's not, let's not bring that in right now because that okay. introduces a whole other uh, frame okay. of reference. Okay. But thank you. Yes, there is a parallel. And Dr. Shankar, you had explained answer to my question very vividly and very exceptionally well and i would like to be able to hear it again is the session being recorded today yes thank you so anshu yes replace the th we can learn to replace negative thoughts with more positive thoughts, higher thoughts. And it is a process. And it's and, uh, what this book is essentially all about. I, I just wanted to comment in there that, you know, it, it, it is like everything, it's a practice, the cultivating <clears throat> positive or higher rather than negative. And I think when we try to approach it like, I, little me, ego, little, little self, I'm going to control my thoughts. I'm not going to have bad thoughts anymore. I'm just going to have good thoughts. Doesn't really work. No, it doesn't. Um, but that's brilliant. Yeah. But being mindful of your thoughts and, and when you find yourself in a whirlwind of negative thoughts, just go, oh, hmm, I'm having a bunch of negative thoughts maybe I will think about this higher thought. And it's just replacing. Precisely. Because, I mean, you know, therapists will tell you, especially hypnotherapists and neurolinguistic folks will tell you that you can't take something away without putting something in its place in your mind. Because if you don't have something to put, like when people want to quit a bad habit, I'm not going to smoke anymore. I'm not going to smoke. If you don't have anything to put in its place that's better, that's appealing, that's whatever, like a higher thought, um, that vacuum's going to be there and that bad thought is going to keep coming in. So the practice is the mindfulness, being aware, and then going, oh, and then bringing that higher thought in. 
precisely and very well said. And that's why the yamas and the niyamas are practiced together. We'll get to that. But I'm really glad we're having this discussion because everybody needs to be clear about what it is that is meant by controlling the thought waves of the mind. It's not becoming thoughtless. <laughs> Ultimately, the waves of the, 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 the thought waves of the mind are stilled, but not because you banged your head with a hammer and become unconscious, as the Swami will say, but because you come to the end of their usefulness. It's a long road, it seems to us, as human beings. But it can be done in this lifetime. And what else are you going to do? And what else are you going to do, exactly? It's like, you know, we've talked about this many times over the decades, but uh, <laughs> the lifetimes <laughs> in the decades, the millennia. But it's like practicing anything, practicing yes. the guitar. I play the guitar. I started when I was a child and, you know, struggled for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can play without looking at my hand constantly. My hand doesn't hurt. I can be doing something else, watching television and playing stuff on the guitar. And it wasn't because I said, I'm going to be a guitar player and I'm going to, you know, it's because I practiced. And all of a sudden, because I practiced, I did get there. And it's like when you get there, when all your thoughts still, that ideal, it's not because you made that happen. It's because you did the practice to get there. Exactly. And to get there. Yeah. That's what Patanjali says. The first six steps are the practice. The first six limbs of yoga are something that you do. Purushakara, self-effort. The last two are something that happens to you. Hello, Shankara. Yes. A while ago, you said. It is not about being thoughtless. And uh, we have I have also heard or read that the practice of meditation is geared towards training our mind to be thoughtless, which I have not been able to achieve. The best I'm able to achieve is to be able to divert my mind by talking to Thakur in my mind or by looking at his picture and not having the straight thoughts, but I'm not without thoughts any moment. The, the, these people who say that the goal of meditation is to become thoughtless are being careless if they say that without further explanation. It isn't that unless you die, this is not going to stop generating thoughts. Hmm. But you're, you can, in spirit, leave this stardust spacesuit, and there is no experiencer. So how can there be any thoughts if there's nothing to experience them? Now, those are just words to us. But this is what we see when we read about Sri Ramakrishna's going into deep samadhi. The body would apparently become lifeless. Someone actually pried open his, pulled open his eye one time and poked his eyeball to see if there was any response. There was no pupillary response. There was no physical response. Mm. But he was able, because of the nature of his being as a verb, to return to that physical form, reanimated, and sometimes it was really quite difficult. Reanimated, but he could not say in words what 
had happened in that deep samadhi because there is no experiencer there. Now we have no idea what that means because we have no idea what it means to be without experience. So when someone says the goal of meditation is to become thoughtless, the way it's understood from here is what you do is you sink below the level of the thoughts and then you sink below the level of sense impressions and then you sink below the level of any impression at all other like bliss or what have you into a silence now silence means lack of vibration <clears throat> And then you return from that and all of the rest is there but you experience it differently because now you know this great silence and it's it seems to have contents it seems to have something to communicate to you but it's not in thoughts or words the great mystics have all spoken of it. Anything else before we go on? This is exactly what a class is about, is getting all of this clear among us all before we go on and try to understand what it is, the process that Patanjali is going to explain to us and that the Swami is going to translate and comment on. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How early can uh, somebody, like in, in terms of age, how early can somebody do yoga? Like in context of what Patanjali is saying. As soon as they have a sense of their I-ness, as soon as they begin to... Um, assert that I-ness, then they can begin to learn the practices and principles of the essential unreality of that I-ness. But you wouldn't teach it to them in the same way that Patanjali is teaching it to them. Uh, if you want to have that conversation, uh, we should have it privately. There, is, there are ways to teach children, and it, it, what it does is has to do is redirecting their attention, rather than, and it, which is what Patanjali is about. It's just a different way for children. Okay, but as soon as they have that sense of I-ness, separate, a uh, separate I then they can be they they can be redirected thanks for the question thank you anything else before we read on okay very good <clears throat> would you read the last couple of sentences Again, uh, Cindy, before we read on into the next. Sure. Um, the mind seems to be intelligent and conscious. Yoga philosophy teaches that it is not. It has only a borrowed intelligence. The Atman is intelligence itself, is pure consciousness. The mind merely reflects that consciousness and so appears to be conscious. Knowledge or perception is a thought wave, vritti, in the mind. All knowledge is therefore objective. Even what Western psychologists call introspection or self-knowledge is objective knowledge, according to Patanjali since the mind is not the seer, 
but only an instrument of knowledge, an object of perception like the outside world. The Atman, the real seer, remains unknown. Would you repeat that sentence, please, from the beginning? Uh, the, uh, the whole section or the sentence? The sentence, just that last sentence. The Atman, the real seer, remains unknown. No, no, I mean the, the one prior to that. Oh. Uh, even what Western psychologists call introspection or self-knowledge is objective knowledge, <clears throat> according to Patanjali. Since the mind is not the seer, but only an instrument of knowledge, an object of perception like the outside world. Yes. So the mind is, that's why it, it isn't, doesn't belong to us. It's something that we see. It's something that we use. Like any other aspect of the world that we see and use. It is not It is important as we think it is. It's just another thing. The Atman, the real seer, remains unknown. Okay, please go ahead, Cindy. <clears throat> Every perception arouses the ego sense, which says, I know this. But this is the ego speaking, not the Atman, the real self. The ego sense is caused by the identification of the Atman with the mind, senses, etc. It is as if a little electric light bulb would, decla would declare, I am the electric current, and then proceed to describe electricity as a pear-shaped glass object containing filaments of wire. Such identification is absurd as absurd as the ego's claim to be the real self. Nevertheless, the electric current is present in the light bulb, and the Atman is in all things, everywhere. When an event or object in the external world is recorded by the senses, a thought wave is raised in the mind. The ego sense identifies itself with this wave. If the thought wave is pleasant, the ego sense feels, I am happy. If the wave is unpleasant, I am unhappy. This false identification is the cause of all our misery. For even the ego's temporary sensation of happiness brings anxiety a desire to cling to the object of pleasure, and this prepares future possibilities of becoming unhappy. The real self, the Atman, remains forever outside the power of thought waves. It is eternally pure, enlightened, and free, the only true unchanging happiness. It follows, therefore, that man can never know his real self as long as the thought waves and the ego sense are being identified. That, do, please read that sentence again. It follows, therefore, that man can never know his real self as long as the thought waves and the ego sense are being identified. So what is the implication? We are going to learn if we follow this and, and most especially if we practice it, we will learn to dis disidentify ourselves with the thought waves and therefore with the ego sense and therefore the limitations that are inherent in both of those things and we will be free. The word in yoga speak is kaivalya, independent, independent of any 
condition or limitation. It seems utterly impossible to us as we sit here. And yet it is what we yearn for with every fiber of our being. And it is why we misidentify those things that make us temporarily, quote, happy, unquote. Oh, that the reason it makes you happy is for in that moment, there is a cessation, a stopping of that sense of separation and the desire it arise, that arises from it. That's why we feel happy, because happiness, the Atman, is our essential nature. So it's very important for us to understand that what we're going to learn if we follow this, and most especially if we practice it, is how to disidentify ourselves with our sense impressions and the thoughts that they give arise that they give that that the sense impressions give rise to, and then the sense of pleasure or pain that comes from our identification with the sense impression and the thought waves that arise from it. And it is a six step process that we will be learning. Any comments or questions? Yes, uh, Brother Shankara, I think uh, to me it seems like it'd be helpful to withdraw and take a witness attitude to all what's happening in your presence, both externally and internally. Yes, the only the only difficulty in that was the active verb, withdraw. What happens is, as we practice this, we become aware of the witness presence. And slowly and slowly, we change our identification from that which we have thought of as ourselves, this stardust space suit self, and that we identify with the witness self. So the withdrawal is not an active verb. I suppose you could say that after you really learn that witness self, that you take refuge there, yes, you withdraw to that. But actually, it seems in practice to be more spontaneous than that. Hmm. Simply okay. because, simply because, you know, once you didn't know how to ride a bicycle, then you do what's necessary to learn to ride the bicycle. And then years later, after you haven't ridden a bicycle, you can get on a bicycle and very quickly you are riding a bicycle again, simply because you know that. Dr. Shankar? Yes? In practice, I found that the withdrawal from the situation Withdrawal of the mind from the situation is difficult. What helps me is to remind myself in the moment that either I say it does not matter or how important is it in big scheme of things or some aphorism of that kind that helps me kind of walk away from, to let my mind walk away from the, what's happening. Yes, our entanglements, as long as we uh, face toward the light and walk toward the light, we can walk away from these things because in the long run, you're right, they really do not matter.
Thank you, BJ. Anyone else? Anything? We really can learn to disidentify ourselves with the contents of our reflected awareness. That is to say, our thought waves, which are far more subtle than we think in the, in the beginning. They reach way down into the latent subconscious. Anything else from anyone before we go on? Am I right that it's a little after one o'clock? It's one o six. That's what I thought. Okay, well we'll we'll leave it for there for this time. Any final thought or comment or question from anyone? All right, dears, I think this is a very nice start. We've uh, heard what it is that the Swami, and I encourage you to read it over again, please, the translators forward. So you get a very clear idea of what Swami Prabhavananda, <clears throat> uh, and for that matter, his collaborator, Christopher Isherwood, believed that they were up to here. And it gives you a sense of who Patanjali is or what he was doing because there isn't, as the Swami said, much known about Patanjali. But, uh, all right. Anything else from anyone before we leave? Thank you, Cindy, for your very capable reading. Om Asato Ma Satgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amrutangamaya Abir Abir Moiti. O dearly beloved self, lead us from this realm of noisy confusion and delusion to thine abode of serenity, silence, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through, light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence. Om. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. Any final thought? All right, until tomorrow morning, for those of you who decide to join us, the talk will be, uh, it's, uh, the perspective is Jnana Yoga, and the title of the talk is Peeling the Onion of the Mind. You'll understand what's meant by that when the talk is introduced. It's a metaphor used by Sri Ramakrishna. 
peeling the onion of the mind. And it won't make you cry. <laughs> no, hopefully it'll make you laugh. So uh, until tomorrow, for those of you who decide to join us, uh, much love to everyone and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Bye.